This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Skillshare, home to over 20,000 classes that could teach you a new life skill. Earlier this month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a chilling report. A report that has taken three years of research and another week of discussions between governments and its writers to finalise, informing the world that we are nowhere near on track to minimise the effects of global warming to just 1.5 degrees. And instead, we are now on track to exceed 3 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by the end of the century. Going above this 1.5 degree change is going to cause serious damage to the livability of this planet. Going to 3 degrees may just open Pandora's box, increasing the likelihood of heat waves, droughts, floods, and just making life more difficult for us and the plants and animals that shared the world with us. In order to avoid that outcome, the IPCC laid out five steps we need to achieve. 1. Global emissions of CO2 need to decline by 45% by 2030. 2. Renewables need to provide 85% of global electricity by 2050. 3. Coal use must reduce to practically zero. 4. 7 million square kilometers of land will be needed for energy crops. And 5. We must reach a net of zero emissions by 2050. These are incredibly ambitious targets that, let's face it, we probably won't achieve without a massive shift in global attitudes. We are on a collision course with disaster and we've no captain steering the ship. So do we have any last minute solutions to save us from catastrophe? Solar radiation management has been touted as our best option for rapidly lowering the planet's temperature. Solar radiation management is a long term for something the Simpsons thought of in 1995. Simply block out the sun to reduce the energy we receive here on the surface of the planet and therefore reduce the temperature. There has been several methods proposed to achieve this, some more realistic than others. The most sci-fi of all the solutions proposes that we place some form of sunshade in space, like the one proposed by Gregory Benford. He recognised the potential of Lagrange Point 1, an area between the Earth and the Sun where the gravitational forces between the Sun and the Earth allow an object in that position to remain in that position. Here, a sunshade would provide a constant reduction in solar radiation, but placing a solid sunshade that would cause a massive shadow roving over the Earth's surface every day is obviously not a reasonable solution. Instead, Benford proposed using a concave Fresnel lens, which would not completely block out the sun, but diffuse its light. A Fresnel lens is a compact lens designed to minimize the weight and bulk of the material required to make it. It takes advantage of the fact that light is only deflected as it passes between the boundary of mediums. Therefore, the thickness of lens material really doesn't matter, only its geometry. So a traditional lens can be drastically reduced in weight, like so. He estimated that a lens with a 1000 km diameter could reduce the solar energy reaching Earth by 0.5 to 1%. At an initial cost of about $10 billion, a far cry from the prices required for our previously discussed method of carbon capture through afforestation of the Sahara, but considering the James Webb Telescope, an object vastly smaller than this lens, itself cost $10 billion, I would say Benford's calculations are more science fiction than science fact. On top of this, Lagrange point 1 is a point of unstable equilibrium. Small disturbances in the Earth's gravitational field can dislodge the object from its position, and so it would need some way of correcting its position frequently. I personally don't see this as a viable solution, and it has not been seriously considered by any governing body. This can't be said for stratospheric aerosol injection. This method seeks to recreate the global cooling effects the world experiences during massive volcanic eruptions, like those of 1991 when Mount Pinatubo erupted, the largest stratospheric disturbance in a century in a time when we had the tools to measure its impact. This eruption not only blew 500 feet of the mountain's peak off, it also injected an estimated 15 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, where it reacted with the water vapour to form sulfuric acid. Atmospheric physics is definitely not my area of expertise, so I asked my friend Simon Clark, who has a PhD in the subject, to explain. The sulfuric acid which formed in the atmosphere in the aftermath of the Pinatubo eruption had a substantial effect on global climate. In the 15 months following the eruption, the global average surface temperature decreased by 0.6 degrees Celsius. And this happened for two reasons. Firstly, the small droplets of sulfuric acid which formed in the atmosphere after the eruption reflected short wavelengths of radiation. Now, the sun mostly emits short wavelengths of radiation, so the sulfuric acid reduced the amount of radiative energy 
from the Sun, which reached the surface of the Earth. Thanks to the first law of thermodynamics, with the same amount of energy being thermally radiated out to space by the Earth, but less energy coming in from the Sun, the Earth's global average temperature decreased. Note, by the way, that this is different from the radiative effects of greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide and methane, which interact with comparatively long wavelengths of radiation. Long wavelength radiation is what the Earth thermally radiates to space. So by injecting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we're doing the opposite of what happened in the aftermath of the Pinatubo eruption. We're limiting the amount of energy that the Earth thermally radiates to space. But the amount of energy that's coming in from the Sun is relatively constant. So the opposite effect happens, and the global average temperature increases. The second reason why the sulfuric acid from the eruption substantially changed the climate is because it was injected into the stratosphere. The stratosphere is the layer of the atmosphere above the layer we live in, the troposphere, and it extends from about 10 kilometers to about 50 kilometers above the surface. And it has very different dynamics to what we're used to seeing in the atmosphere. In particular, there's almost no vertical motion and almost no precipitation. So if you put something up there, it stays up there for a really long time. So the sulfuric acid had the time to radiatively affect the climate, sticking around for much longer than if it had just been injected into the lower atmosphere where it would have been rained out in a couple of weeks. So we know it works. The next part is figuring out how to implement it on a massive scale. Sulfur is a relatively cheap material, but getting it into the stratosphere could be expensive. Some have proposed balloons that will carry the materials into the stratosphere and explode. These are a relatively low cost solution for single low payload trips, like weather data collection or sending random shit really high in the sky with a GoPro for a marketing campaign. But for something like this, where we will need to send millions of tons of material, it's not a clever option. Others who have obviously not considered not only the cost, engineering impossibility, and energy required to pump the materials to that height, have proposed giant towers. Ultimately, the easiest method would be the tried and true method of hauling tons of liquid to the stratosphere with a refueling plane like the KC-10, which will be able to run multiple missions a day and carry 160 tons with each flight. This is a realistic solution that humans could employ quickly in dire straits, but at what cost to our planet? Once we start this program, we cannot stop until we reduce our concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, which itself will take years if not decades of disciplined work around the world. We will need multiple of these aircraft spraying millions of tons of pollutant into our atmosphere to counteract the other pollutants we have released. If we stopped without fixing the underlying issue first, we will undergo rapid climate change to pre-injection levels in just a couple of years. A shock change like this would give ecosystems little time to adapt and would likely result in a massive die-off. It would be like placing a bandage on a wound as it continues to fester under the surface unseen. Climate scientists are confident that global temperatures will stabilize if the correct concentration is reached. We have historic data from volcanic eruptions to show the method works, and we have decent models to calculate how quickly the aerosols will leave the stratosphere, and so how often we would need to fly additional missions. But what we do know is vastly overshadowed by what we don't know. Even our most powerful computer models cannot predict how this method will affect individual countries. We are still struggling to understand how our world is changing with a relatively simple variable like carbon dioxide concentration. Trying to predict how the planet will react if we force it in the other direction is even more complicated. How will plants and microbial life be affected by the decrease in direct sunlight? How will the water cycle change? The rate the Amazon rainforest will inject water into the atmosphere through transpiration will likely fall. How will this modify local and global circulation patterns? Some regions will undergo rapid climate change, with changes in precipitation and temperatures, in ways we cannot predict. What impact will that have on political relations, when some countries benefit and others suffer as a consequence of our geoengineering? Ultimately, the biggest problem this method faces is bureaucracy. Who controls the organization of a massive operation like this, that will have a worldwide impact? Does one country, like the United States, take it upon themselves to alter the climate when their economy starts to suffer? Or will the UN come to an agreement on a target concentration? The technology is cheap enough that a single person with deep enough pockets could take it upon themselves to finance it, putting the fate of billions into the palm of their hand. In a sense, this is an analogous for the problem we are already facing. While small island nations are screaming for change as they literally sink into the ocean, while other regions suffer the worst droughts in decades. But for most, 
acting on climate change is not in their interest. Their commercial inertia just keeps them steamrolling along, not noticing the insignificant minorities in their path. If we could manage to create a single global authority with the power to act on climate change decisively, we would already be in better shape to minimize the impacts of climate change. To make these changes, we need committed leadership. We need more people to care about this issue and take action. I'm trying to use my platform here to encourage you to be that change, and hopefully you can go out and do the same. To use your voice to inspire action. To help you along with that goal, you could take this course on Skillshare from acclaimed TEDx speaker Simon Sinek that teaches you the skills you need to present your ideas in a way that will inspire action. This is just one in over 20,000 classes you could take on Skillshare that range from creative skills like painting and music lessons to technical skills like coding. With professional and understandable classes that follow a clear learning curve, you can dive in and start learning how to do the work you love. A premium membership begins around $10 a month for unlimited access to all courses, but the first 1,000 people to sign up with this link will get their first two months for free. So ask yourself right now, what skill have you been putting off learning? What project have you been dreaming of completing but you aren't sure if you have the skills to do it? Why not start right now and sign up to Skillshare using the link below to get your first two months free. You've nothing to lose and a valuable life skill to gain. As usual, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Twitter, Facebook, Discord server, subreddit and Instagram pages are below.